This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. I have three speaking engagements coming up. The first is October 12th in Denver, then November 19th in Des Moines, Iowa, and November 20th in Chicago, Illinois. For more information and to buy your tickets, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash talks. What happens when the government locks people away in cages and leaves them there? My guest this week found a few answers to that question by looking at the history of prison gangs in America. He is a visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of Law and Society at the University of California at Berkeley Law School, and he's an associate professor in political science at Brown University, but he is also the author of a remarkable book, The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System. This is my interview with David Scarbeck. So I'm here in Berkeley with David Scarbeck, who is the author of a fascinating book on one of my favorite and least favorite topics, prisons, and how they are governed. And the answer he has to how they are governed is surprising to many people, which is that they are largely or in large part governed by the prisoners. And he has a lot to say about that in this book, and he's working on a new book which asks the question globally about prisons, globally both uh, spatially and temporally. So it's a, it's a look at prisons across the world or various prisons across the world and across time. But this book he came out with several years ago blew my mind and many people's minds by what he discovered in terms of the governance of prisons uh, in the United States. Uh, but then he has some things to say about other prisons as well. So David, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. I'm we've, happy to be here. Yeah, we've been talking for a while off and on since that book came out. And finally, we have a chance to actually do this in person. So this is a great opportunity. What I want to know first is sort of how you came to it or why you chose to do this, because you come out of academic economics. You were an economics undergraduate at San Jose State. Then you were a graduate student in economics at George Mason University. Your training is in economics. You have a, a, an ac a very clear and accessible but academic style and approach, and the questions you ask are sort of academic. So prisons, you know, and the culture of prisons and the class associated with prisons are sort of on the other side <laughs> of society from where you and I tend to hang out in university. So how is it that a, that, a, that a big old professor like you would find us spend so much time looking at prisons? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, I've always uh, had a sort of an interest and a concern with uh, mass incarceration in the United States. That's been something that I've sort of uh, observed and been aware of um, even sort of growing up in the Bay Area. Um, academically, when I went to grad school, um, we started asking big questions. Why are some countries rich? Why are some poor? Why is there violence in some places and not others? What drives ethnic conflict? And you can use tools in political economy to answer many of those questions. And prisons, in some ways, are a microcosm of that broader question. How is violence controlled? How do people who have potential economic gains from trade, people who want to socially interact, how do we govern those interactions in a way that can create some benefits for people? And then sort of specifically, uh, I was taking a class as a grad student that uses economic models to explain political constitutions. And I'd read a paper for that class, as you often do, and I was aware that there was a particular gang in California that had its own written constitution. Hmm. So I used the models we use to study political constitutions to understand that gang's written constitution. 
And that basically sort of raised and answered one question, uh, but then raised a bunch of others. So why do the gangs exist in the first place? What are the consequences of their coming into existence? Yeah. So you started this in graduate school f with academic questions. You started from an ac academic position in in when you found the gang, when you found prison gangs as a, as a worthy subject of study. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think uh, sort of growing up, uh, I was very aware of the sort of street gang and prison gang issues in California. Um, and I was familiar that they sometimes had these written rules and constitutions. Uh, but yeah, it was the sort of academic motivation tied with, oh, I think that's really interesting. Um, is there some way I can sort of you know, bring them into what I'm studying, what I'm writing about. Yeah, people don't realize this. We are in, you and I are both California natives, and we are from the world capital, possibly, of, of incarceration, <laughs> are we not? Uh, it's how, definitely up there. How many do we have in prison in the state right now? Oh, uh, well, I haven't checked lately. I think it must be around 115, 120,000. Uh, so it's around Something 100, like over, more than 100, more than 100,000 people annually yeah, are right. in our prisons, in California, our prisons. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's up there with Texas and Louisiana, right? Texas is, the, uh, I think, the largest now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but we've been, California, I keep saying we, California has been doing this for a long, long time, longer than other states, right? The mass incarceration game? Uh, they definitely have. Part of that is just because it's a much bigger population than other states. Um, so the higher rates of incarceration in the U.S. are typically southern states. I'm thinking like uh, Alabama and Louisiana. Uh, but yeah, we've, uh, the, California has locked up a lot of people uh, for a very long time. Yeah, and then so that, you're from the Bay Area just like I am, you know, and sort of the left-wing culture here sort of draws attention to mass incarceration. I'm assuming that's part of it. For me, I got to tell you, I grew up looking at the Bay and looking at San Quentin. Mm -hmm. San Quentin is right there, in yep. a very prominent part of the Bay. I've talked about this before. Anytime you drive from the East Bay, which is where I'm from, to Marin County, which is where a lot of the fun stuff is, you, you drive right past that prison. You look right at it every single time. At least I did. I was always aware of it as a kid. Were you? Did you look at it? And yeah, think about absolutely. It? And I mean, just uh, last week, you know, you drive past it again, and it's been a few years since uh, um, I'd seen it. And it's incredibly striking. It's yeah. uh, an incredible contrast with uh, the real estate that it has, yeah. the view that it has. Yeah. And then, boom, you know, here is the state's oldest prison, you know built in 1852. Um, it's, a, it's actually a very dynamic and interesting prison now, maybe one of the, the better ones, quote, better ones to be in. Mm. But yeah, it, it is, um, it's uh, an incredible sight. You may know this, but I interviewed someone who lived there for 41 years. Hmm. Marvin, Marvin Much was on death row for 41 years, yeah, and got out just recently, two years ago. But he talks about, we talked for three hours, and the gang system never came up in mm -hmm. that conversation. That was a regret I had from that interview. I wish I had asked him more about things like that. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about that? I mean, let's talk about San Quentin first, and, or California prisons in general. How are they organized internally by the prisoners? How, how does this go down? Yeah, well, and so the, it's a little different in the condemned unit, uh, where I don't think the gangs are very prominent like they are in sort of all of the other 30 I'm sorry, prisons. I think Marvin was never actually on death row, mm -hmm. but he was... He was their first-degree murder charge, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I don't know exactly what the status was, yeah. but anyway, yeah. So, so the gangs um, have an incredibly important influence on, you know, just about every aspect of a prisoner's uh, life uh, in social activities, economic activities. Things are broken down by racial groups, which are controlled by particular gangs, prison gangs. Um, and they operate in sort of what, as an academic, uh, we would call a community responsibility system. Hmm which means that everyone in the prison, uh, just about, has to affiliate with some racial slash gang group. And within those groups, the gang is responsible, each gang member is responsible for their own members' actions. So if an individual incurs a drug debt to a member of a rival group, it's not just that individual that's responsible for its repayment, it's the gang's repayment. And so the consequence of that is that there's a lot of uh, in-group pressure to manage and control the behavior of members in order to ease interactions with uh, other racial groups, other gang groups. Hmm. Yeah, so, so these, I think a lot of people know this, that there are gangs organized around race in prisons, right? Mm -hmm. People know about the Aryan Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a real gang, right? Yep. Okay. And then for the Mexicans, though, there's two gangs in California. Is that right? Uh, there's three. Three? Two, two are the most prominent. Okay. What are they? Uh, there's the Nuestra Familia and the Mexican Mafia. And what's the third one? The third one is the Fresno Bulldogs, mm. uh, which are uh, relatively smaller, but a, a sort of very serious and active uh, group mm. in uh, central California. Okay. And 
and then for black prisoners, what's the what are the organizations uh, or the gangs? The traditional one is the Black Guerrilla Family, hmm. uh, and then there are uh, Bloods and Crip affiliates uh, or contingents uh, within those. They're less consolidated, like the Hispanic gangs are. Okay. And so, if you enter a prison in California now, you are basically obligated to join one gang or another just for your own personal safety. Is that right? You're obligated to affiliate with and follow the rules of these gangs. So I sort of think of there are different levels of membership within these gangs. There's the minimum, which is that you have to uh, follow the rules uh, that are assigned to your particular group. For example, um, different racial groups go to lunch first on different days. Mm -hmm. And you're obligated to follow that rule for your race. There's a more serious and more rare sort of full member, made member of a prison gang, uh, which is a, is a much smaller minority of prisoners. And these are people who are committing to uh, work in the gang for life. So just about everybody who goes to prison has to affiliate at that sort of lesser level and relatively few will sort of go all the way uh, and, and sort of join for life. Hmm including after uh, release from prison. Okay, so God forbid, but if I ever go to prison in California, I would. you're saying I would basically have to be at least nominally a member of the Aryan Brotherhood? Um, or one of their subsidiary groups. Okay. Uh, there, there will be uh, what, what's called a shot caller for your race. It'll be a white shot caller. And there's going to be certain rules uh, that he's going to tell you. And you're obligated to follow them. And if you don't, uh, you'll have... Uh, you'll be talked to or you'll be, you know, maybe something more serious, mm -hmm. encouraged to comply with those rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't, yeah, there's a very serious threat of violence that um, that would, might, might, might happen to you. So if I go to prison and some Mexican guys beat me up and I haven't done anything with the Aryan Brotherhood and I am Thaddeus Russell, a known anti-Nazi, uh, can I go to the Aryan Brotherhood and ask for their protection? Yeah, I mean, again, it would probably be a more subsidiary group, but <laughs> you're expected to follow, um, you know, you're expected and, and required to um, fall in line and program, as they often say, with your racial group. And that's also true if you were unaffiliated, prisoners of other ethnic or racial groups would complain to the white shot caller and say, hey, you've got a new guy in the yard. He's not programming. He's not, he's in our area, not your area. You need to sort of get, you know, get him you need to put them in line and, and tell them what's up. And you, you say in the book that gangs will actually discipline their own. They'll actually beat up their own people uh, if they cross another gang in, yeah. in certain ways. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And again, it's because there's this desire to avoid large-scale violent vi uh, riots and serious violence across racial groups. Mm. So if a, if a prisoner violates one of these rules that has the potential for there being a sort of prison gang war, that's not good for anybody. And so, they, yeah, they punish their own members to sort of follow the rules. I mean, it really is, at, at least so far, it is analogous to nation states, is it not? Yeah, and I, I think there is a sort of story, uh, both of state formation and state relationships. Yeah. Um, there's sort of, just as there's sort of international anarchy in a world system, these groups are interacting, they have the threat of violence, there's membership, and there's no third party that's really able to control uh, the, the gangs or to resolve conflict between them. So yeah, in that sense, they're, they're, both the international world of nation states and gangs, there's a lot of parallels in uh, the problems they face and, and, and the solutions that they find. So I'm thinking about this. So you said that your thesis is that they organize around race in large part to stave off conflict between the ra so-called races. So I mean, what's interesting uh, that I discovered when s preparing this book is that prisons in the 1950s and 60s were less racially segregated right. than they are now. Right. And that struck me as strange yeah. because, it, you know, measures of overt racism have fallen dramatically since that period. So right. why would there be a rise of race based prison gangs? Um, and, and I think it has to do with this role of gangs governing. And so. One um, argument for why gangs are racially segregated, of which, as far as I'm aware, that's universal. There are not multi-ethnic prison gangs in California. Wow. Um, the reason why, I think, is because gangs are sort of the purpose of them is to facilitate uh, living amongst each other and living amongst strangers, people who you don't know. And so if somebody has a problem with you or you have a problem with somebody, but you don't know who that person is, 
who do you know which shot caller to go to to resolve that problem or to complain about their behavior? And so part of it, not all of it, but part of the racial segregation, I think, is simply that if you're in a community with a bunch of strangers, what's the lowest cost way to know with which group someone affiliates? It's, it's the look at, look at their okay. skin. Okay. And so I, I, I think there's um, clearly lots of um, racial and racist uh, iconography. I'm sure that there are many racist uh, prison gang members, but overwhelmingly, I don't think most people in prison are racist. Mm -mm. As they often say, I'm not a racist. I have friends of all races on the outside. They say in here, the rules are, are race-based. And mm. so I have to comply in a sort of racialized system. Is fraternization allowed? Can you be friends with someone from another race? Yeah. I mean, there can be friends. Uh, sometimes there are rules at different time periods, like you couldn't share a cigarette with someone of a different race. Where at one point you couldn't um, sit at the same table uh, at lunch with someone of a different race. Um, so there are margins on which, uh, yeah, there's lots of, uh, you know, co-ethnic co interactions. Mm -hmm. um, sharing a cell with a member of another race, typically sort of forbidden. So there's, uh, you know, an intricate and detailed, and I'm sure I don't know all of them, um, guides for who you can and can't interact with in what ways. Okay, so they organize around race to avoid mass scale conflicts like race riots, which are no good for anybody, I guess, is what you're saying. Yeah. And the easiest way to organize, and they, they chose race because it's the easiest way to organize people. I'm not sure if there was some conscious decision. Sure. Um, a lot of these gangs emerged in the late 50s and early to mid 60s. A lot of them draw on um, civil rights style movements, uh, like the United Farm Workers Union, for example. They take some of those logos. These things are explicitly influencing the, the very first gang members as they emerge. Hmm. So it's not just this very functional factor. I just I think that's one important part of it. Hmm. Uh, so so they're, they are organizing gangs to avoid social chaos, right? Without, they're assuming that if they did not exist as gangs, if they didn't self-organize into gangs, that they would be living in social chaos. <laughs> so, I mean, that's quite a statement, right? That the prisoners assume that they will be living in chaos, that their lives will be in danger if they don't organize gangs, that gangs are that necessary just for basic functioning. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, you hear that repeatedly from, you know, especially formerly incarcerated people, they say, uh, look, the gangs cause problems, but they solve a lot of problems, too. If I've got a, a beef with somebody, the gangs can stop that without violence. If I want to, you know, get access to some illicit drugs in the prison, the gangs are the ones who uh, participate in the underground economy, but also regulate it. Yeah. Uh, they sometimes set rules for how far in debt you can go, for example, in an illicit economy in a prison. So what's the evidence that these gangs are a social good so far? I think there's probably a couple different types of evidence. One is um, simply an argument about um, on the individual level, right, is racking up examples of them providing um, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, so we see that regularly. Another is that they facilitate the illicit contraband trade, which, of course, from the sort of prison warden's perspective is a bad thing, but mm -hmm. from prisoner's perspective uh, is a good thing. Yep. So in that sense, they provide um, a desired uh, social function. My argument isn't that they're on net good or entirely good. Sure. There's a lot of really negative aspects um, in principle and practice about how much influence that they have. But yeah, a, a prevention of disputes and adjudication peacefully of disputes and maintenance and regulation of uh, the illicit economy seem to be the three major positive benefits from sort of their operation and governance. There's a shocking statistic in your book about violence in prisons. Mm. And, and just talk about that and how it corresponds with the rise of gangs. So there's a, a lot of uh, there's a lot of very good criticisms about criminal justice issues in America. One of the underreported and stunning ones, however, is that prisons since the 1970s have gotten shockingly safer. Now, maybe still not safe enough. In fact, that's part of my argument. But the rate of prison homicides, for example, I think it fell something like 95% between 1975 and 2005. So at the same time that gangs are coming into existence and becoming incredibly powerful, violence falls dramatically. Um, now, 
I'm, in, in the book, I'm not quite making the argument that gangs caused the decline because other things are changing as well. Right. There's more professionalization of corrections, for example. Uh, lots of other things are changing that could cause that decline. But I use that fascinating um, fact to counter an alternative explanation, which is if you read a newspaper article about a prison gang, um, you know, five times out of ten or more, they're going to say the violent prison gang X. The Department of Corrections says that they have, quote, an agenda of violence. It's as if they think that gangs form to promote violence, to be violent. Right. And um, there's simply no evidence for that, you know, uh, in, that, in that general sense. Mm -hmm. the, those facts refute that alternative interpretation. Um, there are instances where gangs use violence, but when gangs have control, there's no reason to be violent. Right? There's, no, there's no immediate return, certainly not a financial return, once you're powerful from using violence. Right. So violence happens, and we can see this in sort of the Brazil case as well, when there's disequilibrium, when there are competing gangs, no one has control, there's not some established factions. When people are trying to find out how much they can control, that's when you see a lot of violence across groups. Once that's established, violence typically falls. I got to think that the, the rise of prison gangs especially in states like California, where they are such a major force, major governing force inside the prisons, I've got to think that has something to do with the decline in violence over the last 30 or 40 years. I've got to think that's a significant part of it, not all of it. It's got to be part of it. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that, that, that makes sense. It's not, uh, I haven't looked into it very, very closely. Well, you have said overwhelmingly that prisoners state, have stated for years and years and years, that the reason they joined gangs in prisons was for security. Right. Right? Yeah. Not, not to kick somebody's ass, not for sadistic <laughs> reasons. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, people join gangs because they would be unsafe otherwise, and, and they're sort of forced to do so. And correctional officers, you know, will very frequently tell you, yeah, I'll ask them, you know, well, I'm, I'm an academic, you know, I wouldn't have to affiliate with these groups, I hope. And they say, well, yeah, of, you know, of course you would have to. You know, you wouldn't be safe otherwise. So, you know, a lot of the, the in writing the book, you know, a lot of what I report on is all incredibly obvious and well-known to anyone who's worked or lived in a prison in California. And so what's sort of shocking to sort of us as sort of non-insiders um, is ev common knowledge. Everyone already knows that. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I mean, there's so many Californians get put in prison and now that I'm back living here. I'm actually thinking, I got to be prepared, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a real possibility. Um, this organizing around race thing, you know, it's, it stops them from organizing collectively, right? It, it stops them from organizing as prisoners rather than mm. as white prisoners and black prisoners and Mexican prisoners. And there's, I, I don't know, I mean, there's a tragedy there, I suppose. Um, but maybe it's better in that, the, right now what we have is essentially multiple competing states, I suppose, or at least multiple states or multiple institutions, or organizations acting somewhat like states within prisons, meaning the gangs. What if we had one prison gang governing all the races? Would that be better? Probably not, because that's a monopoly, mm -hmm. you know, with more people in its jurisdiction. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a tough call. And you've also made the argument that these are not these are not really nation states either, right? There's differences. There's important differences between a prison gang and a nation state. Yeah, there, there's there's definitely important differences. Um, you know, when we think of nation states or the ones that we think perform better, um, there's things like rule of law, uh, robust institutions of accountability, and some general conformance with morality often, not always. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of ways in which I think the gangs are um, maybe best understood as sort of failed or weak states, okay. states that prey on their citizens, um, mm -hmm. which is historically sort of the most common form of state um, 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 sort of globally, right? As most states in history have been, you know, not effective, not had capacity, not had a lot of respect for their citizens. So you come out of a kind of an anti-statist world. You went to San Jose State and you studied with libertarians there and then you went to George Mason, which is famous for its libertarian economics department, which is where you got your PhD. You've told me before we started interviewing that you're not really that much of a libertarian. And I would say maybe you're really, really not much of a libertarian because your argument, I think, right, is kind of going in a non-libertarian direction here, which is that the, in your book, you state, I think this is right, the reason for the rise of the gangs in California and United States prisons is 
because of the failure of the government to adequately govern those prisons, to, to adequately provide safety and security to the inmates. Then, in your newer work, you contrast American prisons with, I, you sort of seem to think that they're better, prisons in Scandinavia, in particular Norway, which are highly governed, well-financed, well-funded. I mean, they look, like, they look better than most American hotels. I mean, <laughs> truly, they do. And you say there's no conflict, no violence, even in the maximum security prisons in Norway. So, I mean, you know, that, I would think that some people would look at this and think, oh, so what we need is more government presence in the prisons, more government funding for the prisons. We, meet, we need Scandinavian prisons, like we need Scandinavian healthcare, mm-hmm. David. <laughs> I mean, so is that, has anyone brought this up or have you thought about that? Uh, I have, I, I've thought a lot about it. I mean, I, I, I very much sort of pursue the research with you know, a focus on social science and try to put sort of ideological baggage like to the side. I think oh, that's the, on. I think that's the goal uh, <laughs> is to, is to sort of use the tools of, of thinking about social science. Um, th- that doesn't mean there aren't implications that are normative and certainly very relevant. So the way that I think about it is that um, the gangs emerge, so gangs haven't always existed in prisons, and we can talk about why that is later, yeah, yeah. but um, the gangs emerge um, to provide governance when officials don't provide governance. And what's sort of undesirable about the gangs is this intense internal pressure that I mentioned. Hmm. Right, you're forced to follow along racial and ethnic lines. You're forced to follow the rules. There's not a whole lot of accountability. Um, that sort of system of mutual responsibility actually looks a lot like clan-based societies. Hmm. So if you look at Somalia, lots of uh, lot, lot, many regions in Africa and historically around the world, clans are organized a lot like gangs. You're part of a group. The clan is responsible for clan members' behavior, and so some of the consequences of that are that. Um, clans have a tremendous in-group pressure to control what their members do. Women can't go out and interact with people from other groups because it may cause clan versus clan bias. And so there's a tremendous sort of uh, authoritarianism within a clan and within a gang um, in a way that I think is, is not, is very undesirable. And so what I'm getting to here is that there's something very similar about gangs and clan-based societies is that they both have tremendous in-group pressure they arise in communities that are fairly large, and they exist in places where they're not strong, effective states. And so, yes, in some ways, the argument is if prison officials govern more effectively, smaller prisons, better prisons, for example, then we wouldn't see these clan-based, like, or gang-based entities come into existence. Mm -hmm. So you're presuming, though, that there needs to be some sort of social institution or organization for there to be a civil society that looks something like a state. Uh, I wouldn't say I I wouldn't make that general claim without thinking it through a little bit. Uh, (laughs) It's a big one. But, yeah, I think that there are a tremendous number of examples from contemporary and historical periods showing that when populations are relatively small, they can govern themselves without a sort of third-party coercive entity. And there's a huge literature about, you know, medieval trade, about frontier society. The not-so-wild Wild Wild West is one example of a book on the topic. And so the question really, and sort of the point of the purpose of the book, is to say, okay, if you have a small group of culturally homogenous individuals and everybody knows everybody pretty well, okay, they can govern themselves, they can exist in statelessness, can you scale it up? Mm, mm. What if it's very diverse and small? What Mm. if it's homogenous but very large? What if both of those things are going on? What if there's a selection mechanism that brings, you know, quote, the least cooperative people in society into the community to constitute that society? So in some ways, the book is an attempt to engage with this sort of somewhat esoteric uh, law and economics literature, which is to say, when can self-governance, when can self-exchange work? What are the limits, if any, of that? So this ties into the history piece of the Mm -hmm. book, right, which is really interesting. So as you just said, there were no really gangs in prisons, at least in California or elsewhere, we think, before the 1970s. Is that right? Um, Late 1950s, early 1960s is when they emerge in California, which is arguably the first state to experience a sort of real, you know, sort of what we think of as prison gangs. And so my basic argument is, you know, so California's had prisons for more than 100 years with no gangs. There are some states in the U.S., that don't have a serious prison gang problem. 
And as I discussed in my upcoming book, there are some countries that don't have prison gangs. So mm -hmm. prison doesn't equal prison gang. And so why is that? Why are there prisons with no gangs? And um, the argument I make in the book is that when the prison populations are relatively small, when prisons are fairly small, and when they're fairly homogenous, and also if they're full of people who have been to prison for previous sentences, all of those things combined together mean that um, informal mechanisms of social control can work really well. Things like gossip, ostracism, and shaming. Those things can work well if you care about your reputation and people know your reputation, but that's only possible in relatively small communities. So gossiping about somebody who nobody knows isn't very painful to the person who's being gossiped about. Right. So as the size of the prison population grows, these informal mechanisms, they become less effective. They were great because they worked well and they were very cheap to produce. Um, it didn't require a lot of sort of social organization, collective action. But in big prison populations, nobody knows the person you're complaining about. And so that person has no incentive to conform to social norms to avoid the gossip. Gossip, shaming, and ostracism on a local level in a decentralized society. Prisons, police, and armies in centralized societies, right? And large prisons, mm -hmm. large prisons with lots of guards and lots of prisoners. And so the argument in your book, right, is that the reason for the rise of the prison gangs is that essentially they were locking up too many people to be able to give them adequate service inside the prisons. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, so the argument is sort of a few pieces, but yeah, when the total size of the prison population goes from fewer than 5,000 to more than 100,000, these mechanisms don't work very well. And then the size of prisons has grown. Um, so a height of a, the average size prison in California by population uh, was more than 5,000 people per prison. Hmm. That's very different from a 500 person prison or 600 person prison where maybe those things would work well. So it's a combination of a, of a bigger population, bigger prisons, and then of course you might cycle through a few different prisons while incarcerated over a few years. And every time you move, you're sort of meeting a whole new group of strangers. So those simple mechanisms, just they, they're not effective uh, any longer. Okay, so now you're sounding more libertarian. Right. Because this is basically sounding like Hayek a bit, isn't it? I mean, it's a decentralized. Your, your argument is that the, the problem here is centralization, the knowledge problem that it, people, the central authority cannot know what is best or how to govern the. No, in, in a large. No, I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> I'm trying to box you. Yeah. In. So, you know, so, so I, I don't think it is. I think it's okay. more of. Uh, so, for example, um, in England, they incarcerate about 80,000 people uh, throughout the country. Wow. And That's, okay, so hold on. So in the United States, it's what, 2.3 million? A yeah, little, little less, but yeah, about that. And it, in England, it's where? It's what? Uh, it's 80,000. 80,000, <laughs> right. Um, and and they here. don't have a serious prison gang problem like we do. Mm -hmm. There is some street gang activity that transfers over, but overwhelmingly, prisoners say, no, there's nothing like those gangs going on. So why is that? You know, and I don't think it's because sort of, English are more polite or something like that. They have 80,000 people. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here's the contrast, right? More than 100,000 people in California. I think we have 34 prisons right now. They have 80,000 people in 125 or so prisons. Oh, wow. So the average size prison in England is only about six or 700 people. Wow. And when you break that down by wing, you got sort of 50 people on a wing. Well, guess what? Maybe these informal decentralized mechanisms can work pretty well. They don't work well in the big prisons, the big prison population. So the counterfactual uh, would be, what if California um, expanded from 34 prisons to 134 prisons? And the prediction would be that gangs would become much less relevant, much less important. So it's not even really a sort of knowledge problem issue. There's, there's, there's sort of just different ways of running prison operations. It may be that prison officials and the broader political um, institutions don't have the information or the incentives to change. So it, there's a lot of, we, you know, economists would call them externalities or uh, external costs created by running prisons like we do in California, but political decision makers don't bear many of those. Hmm. So a, a lot of the harm that's done uh, on prisoners and, and prisoners' families, uh, that's not something that they're feeling directly in their cost-benefit analysis when they're deciding whether to make a few really big prisons or a lot of really small ones. Isn't it, it is it 
cheaper? What, what, which is cheaper? So the, well, so it depends on yeah. what you count. Uh, so they say that there are economies of scale for bigger prisons. So you build one cafeteria, and it's a lot cheaper to feed a lot of people than to build many different cafeterias for smaller groups. And that may be true. But the key, as any economist will tell you, to cost-benefit analysis is you have to count all of the costs and all of the benefits. One of the costs is organized gangs that have an incredible reach outside of prison, by the way, mm -hmm. while incarcerated. That's not going into the calculus when they decide what the efficient size or optimal size of a prison is. So I think that if you don't count many of the costs, big prisons make sense. But if you incorporated those, we should have much smaller prisons. Okay. So basically your position is we should have more prisons. <laughs> I just to, to be fully clear, <laughs> the U S locks up way too many people yeah, I know. and, uh, we could get away with incarcerating a lot fewer people for a lot shorter as well as expanding a, a variety of different things. You want so. to decentralize it. You want fewer prisoners and decentralized and you want to de decentralize the system. I'm not sure if I want to decentralize it in, in a sort of political sense. Okay. Um, so it's not obvious, um, it's not obvious, for example, that county jails are run better than state prisons. Um, those are more decentralized, I guess, in a political way. Mm -mm. Federal prisons uh, tend to be run a little bit better. better right. So it's not obvious. And again, there's uh, differences across these things other than how decentralized they are. Um, I think the key is um, smaller prisons are easier to govern by officials and prisoners tend to turn to more decentralized governance mechanisms in smaller prisons. And that, that seems like a, a, a reasonable um, way to go. Is there something that interferes with your happiness? Something that's stopping you from living the life that you want? There's a new online service that can help. BetterHelp Online Counseling can connect you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's convenient, affordable, and effective. You can get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions plus chat and text with your therapist. BetterHelp's licensed professional counselors specialize in treating depression, stress, anxiety, relationship problems, sleep issues, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem issues. Anything you share is confidential. BetterHelp has 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states with four communication modes available, text, chat, phone, and video. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. BetterHelp is secure, convenient, and professional. It is not a crisis line. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Unregistered listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code RENEGADE. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash renegade. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash renegade. So let's talk about this new book, this new project that you've been working on. It's fascinating. You finished the manuscript and turned it in. You have multiple chapters on multiple subjects, although there's a, there's a theme and an argument running through it. Um, you look across the world, you look across time, you look in the 19th century, you look in the 21st century, you look in various countries, including the United States. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. So let's, let's, let's poke at a few of these. Um, one of the things that stands out to me is the work you've done on borrowing on other scholars too, on the prisons or is it just one prison in Bolivia? There's a, yeah, just one. Yeah. San Pedro. Prison. Okay. Yeah. The one prison in Bolivia. It's an incredible story. It, it is a prison where officials essentially never enter or their presence is in, uh, in very infrequent. Um, they've essentially, as in many Latin American prisons, left it to prisoners to uh, govern, to run. Um, so officials provide water and electricity, uh, which uh, you're, you have to pay your bill w to be released. You have to pay for those things, so it's not free. Wow. And they provide some sort of, um, I've heard it described as a gruel-like substance, a sort of very basic food. Other than that, there's no health care, there's no other food provisions, there's no education provision. Um, the prisoners themselves, to the extent that they want any of those things, have to sort of provide the resources, the administration, and the governance uh, associated with them. I thought Bolivia was a social democracy. What's going on here? <laughs> right? Didn't they have a left-wing president for a while there? Uh, you are allowed to vote in prison, and I learned that one of the candidates uh, ran for uh, sort of a pretty high political office while incarcerated, and he, yeah. he came in second. 
I mean, no, but it was part of that whole movement with Chavez and Venezuela. That I forget the name of the guy. The, the head of, of Bolivia was a, basically a socialist. So he, he oversaw this? Like, he was okay with this? Just throwing people into a hole and leaving them there? Uh, I mean, so it's it's been that way for many years. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the sort of interesting twist to the story is that um, there's been a flourishing of, I think, business, of civil society. Um, families live with incarcerated spouses or kids live in the prison. And many of the, hmm. um, many of the depictions of life there, um, it's definitely impoverished. Um, but there's, um, you know, they're not being regularly abused by guards, for example. And they are allowed to trade with people in and out of the prison. You can go and visit the prison and, and walk in. So there's sort of international trade between prisoners and people on the outside. Huh. And there's, you know, something of a flourishing market economy in a sense. Um, there are um, food stands available. There are services that are offered to, you know, fix your shoes or to make furniture, um, artwork. There's a little economy in there um, infused with resources uh, and money from the outside. That actually means that if you wish, you can start a business, make some money, use that money to... Uh, supplement or you know substitute for what officials you know what what gruel they would provide I have to say I mean I haven't been there and I haven't even seen pictures I've just heard your descriptions but given the choice I'm pretty sure I would choose that prison over San Quentin or Pelican Bay or Folsom or maybe any American prison would you um, there's a lot, there's a lot of reasons to sort of speak, uh, in, <laughs> yeah. in favor of it. Um, there's, um, a, a lack of supervision and control that's replaced with, uh, you know, scarcity, but a scarcity that you can respond to yeah. and alleviate to some extent. Right. Um, there's a, a fascinating work by, uh, Jennifer Pierce, uh, who's a PhD student and she studied, um, let's see, I think it was the Dominican Republic. And they have both systems of prisons. They have the sort of classic Latin American one, like I've described, and then something that looks a lot more like sort of Western American style command and control prisons. And her surveys on prisoners and their perceptions of the quality of life very much often find that prisoners prefer the old style style uh -huh. because there's less corruption and abuse by officials. They complain that sometimes there are prisoners who are leaders that they disagree with sort of how they run things. But on average, if I recall correctly, the old school style, the Latin American style prison is more preferred by prisoners. Uh huh. I was right. Now, what about the Norwegian style the, I've seen before I met you? I know I've known about the Norwegian prisons. I've seen pictures and videos. They're unbelievable. They're yeah, unbelievable. They're they look like fancy hotels. They're, they're incredibly striking. So in thinking about sort of the Nordic region, yeah. um, and what, what they're sort of most well known for are open prisons. And these are places that don't have sort of locked cells. Sometimes the prisons don't have walls at all. Um, those are the majority of prisoners aren't in those so-called open prisons. The slight majority and maybe 60 percent uh, in some countries are in closed prisons, which look a little closer to the U.S., um, but it's striking how much resources are available to them. Um, new buildings, they have access to their own kitchens where they can prepare their own food. Um, they sometimes have um, very nice sort of recreational areas. They have TVs. They're given more privileges than you know, just about any uh, American prison that I've heard of. Um, so even in maximum security prisons, you know, the housing looks better than where my students you know, usually sleep. They have access to food. Um, they're often allowed to leave the prison, to work in the community and come back at night, to go shopping in local shopping stores, grocery stores. Mm. Um, so yeah, without a doubt, I mean, that, 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 may, that is an, an incredibly more um, resource uh, available, <laughs> resource rich. Um, the, they're typically governed uh, more effectively. So there's more training and better pay for the correctional staff uh, in many Nordic prison systems. Uh, who are present, who there's typically a ratio of one prison worker per prisoner, mm -hmm. which allows them to sort of govern well. Um, they engage in a lot of sort of mentoring and uh, sort of therapeutic relationships. Uh, so it, it just overwhelmingly, it looks very, very different. There's still problems with Nordic prison systems, so it's not to say it's perfect, but relative to Western or American prisons, um, a very, very different uh, environment. I'm thinking about proximity to authorities. 
So in the Bolivian prison, it sounds like there's basically no authorities except the, the guards at the walls, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, right? In the Norwegian prison, the authorities are everywhere. They're inside, outside, they're teaching you things, they're feeding you, they're probably your therapist, they're probably giving you massages at night, who <laughs> knows, right? Um, and so there's a cost and a benefit there. I mean, it depends on what you think about the state and governments and prisons, I suppose, and crime generally and law. But, you know, if, if yes, if you're comfortable with the government being very close to your business and all in your business mm -hmm. and in your life, then I would imagine the Norwegian model would be pretty much perfect. That's the, that's the prison you would want. If, on the other hand, you're skeptical or antagonistic toward the government, don't want it close to you in any way, I would think you'd rather be a Bolivian criminal than a Norwegian one. <laughs> Right. I mean, it sounds like you can create your own sort of it's like a pirate colony in a way. These prisons in Latin America. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a great question. Um, <laughs> they, we, I don't think there are surveys sort of yeah. on that yet. Well, that's your job. That's what um, you do. Right. Yeah. You know, there are. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're two very different style approaches. And some of the complaints that you'll hear in studies of Nordic prisons is that. Um, yeah, they look nice, but there's this strong pressure to comply with sort of Nordic culture. Um, one study found that, um, you know, it, you felt so free, but you weren't actually. So you were always afraid that you were going to sort of forget that you're in prison and violate some rule. Mm -hmm. Or you have the freedom to make a phone call to a spouse, but you don't have the ability to help that person. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of aware of problems, but can't respond to them. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're two very different styles. Having not personally, you know, experienced either, I, I couldn't say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So... I take it you've never been in prison? Uh, I've never been incarcerated. And do you know anyone? Have you ever known anyone who's been in prison? Yeah, uh, I've known m many, you know, f fairly many um, formerly incarcerated people. Really? Sure. Um, you know, from, you know, a couple weeks in the county jail to, you know, many years in state prisons. I can think of one person who I once knew a bit who was in prison for nine months for a white collar crime. And one person who was in L.A. County Jail because his wife accused him of beating her mm. and he was released. And that's it. As far as I know, as far as I know, I think those are the only people I've and I'm 54 years old now and a California native <laughs> who lived in New York. Also prison, big prison places. And I've that's so basically I've really never known anyone. Mm -hmm. And yet it is top three of my political issues in mm. importance. I can't quite explain that, except that I've always been terrified of prisons. I think growing up in the Bay Area has something to do with that. I think because you can see Alcatraz and San Quentin pretty much every day, and you're sort of forced to every single day, at least for me, it got into me. Um, but I'm just wondering if that had anything to do with, I mean, we already asked you this, but like, you know, as you're doing this work, let me ask it in a different way. I write about foreign policy. I don't write about prisons. I write a little bit about it, um, but I write a lot about foreign policy, a lot about war lately. And boy, does it get to me. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about when you're talking about the economy of scale and designing the cafeteria, you know, at, the, at a big prison might be cheaper to have one big cafeteria to feed them. It just, and you use the word calculus, I just thought, what a grim, dark mm. calculus that is, mm. you know. How do, we, how do we warehouse, contain, you know, large numbers of human beings, you know, yeah. uh, efficiently and effectively? Uh, I don't know, just, uh, and you've done this work. I mean, yeah. I, after writing about World War II, let me tell you for a couple of years, I mean, boy, it really gets into you. I mean, yeah. has it, have you had I mean, similar it, uh, It's experiences? bleak. It's yeah. bleak. Um, you know, the sort of calculus of control, you yeah. might call it. There it uh, is, yeah. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, and sometimes depressing and sad. Um, I'm finishing the second book, and I don't think I'm going to work on prisons for a while. It's probably time for a change of pace. Um, I do think it's, you know, probably the most important social problem facing the United States today. Hmm. I think it's outrageous how many people we uh, incarcerate. Uh, I think it's uh, tragic, the sort of racial and class, you know, slant in it, the biases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I've sort of thought, well, I, I need to understand this, and I think I've got something to say about it, and I'm in fascinated with it. And, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not the cheeriest um, topic. Yeah. I saw a video, this is completely random, I think it was completely random, I saw it on YouTube, of a prison fight in Chicago, I believe it was at the county, what's the, it's like the famous county, Cook County lockup mm -hmm. or whatever, Cook County jail, 
I'm just sort of this big open room with cells in it. And there were just a bunch of prisoners and they look, you know, roughly half black, roughly half Latino, something like that. And at some point there was a fight between two of them. And next thing you know, everybody's fighting everybody mm-hmm. and people are getting knocked out and people are unconscious. And this is before the guards have even arrived. Mm-hmm. It's just a melee. It's just, it is just this stark, grotesque violence. You know, someone getting clubbed from behind with a sucker punch and knocked unconscious, you know, just mm-hmm. complete rant. Like the things that you fear the most, you know, about prison. Um, I was thinking, man, what those people need is some gangs. I mean, it looked, it looked like it, it looked like a gang free environment, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it looked like anarchic violence to me, which is what neither the state nor gangs want. Right. They don't, it's, they're not anti-violence, obviously, they, but they are very much opposed to anarchic violence mm-hmm. in both cases, both the state and gangs. Is that right? Yeah. And so the, I mean, the gangs in California use violence often against their own members, but in very controlled ways, you, you have to sort of get permission to have a fight with somebody, in which case they'll find the right cell at the right time where it won't explode into mm-hmm. some sort of riot. So, yeah, I mean, the, there, you know, if there needs to be some way to avoid that, you know, a bunch of violence happening is bad, you know, as you mentioned earlier, for everyone. So that is why this is fundamentally a political economy research project, because that's the problem. How do we control violence in a society, especially when that society is large, mm-hmm. diverse, and, you know, there's a lot of gains from trade that are available when we have big, diverse communities, mm-hmm. right? That's Adam Smith, David Ricardo. <laughs> um, so how do, we, how do we get the benefits of size and diversity with, and avoid the violence? Right. And so that's the question is what institutions can do this? How do they work? Where do they come from? Right. Uh, so that tells me that the criminal of our imagination, this guy who's a sadist, right, the guy who wants to hurt other people, that's, that's, his, that's his primary motivation in life for everything he does, right? That's who we imagine criminals to be generally. And those people do exist. They are mm-hmm. out there. But your work suggests pretty strongly that they are a minority, a small minority, and to the extent that they do exist or when they do pop up in prisons, they're not going to do well. Right? The, the kind of person who is a, who's driven by sadism is not going to do well in a prison that has established gangs in it. Yeah, uh, that's, I think that's exactly right. I think it, it's wrong to model um, sort of incarcerated people as, yeah, you know, violence or uh, violence maximizing or sadistic. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, there's a mix of people and um, that doesn't seem accurately to describe sort of anything that I've seen or observed. And it is, um, the gangs do tend to put a lot of pressure to control um, uh, unexpected or random acts of violence. So, like, it's sort of commonly reported that, you know, prisoners who are un- unstable or, you know, they may not just they, they can be good at violence, but you don't know if they're going to be violent to you. That's someone that people don't like to be around, especially if you're confined in sort of close quarters. Right. Yeah. And there's all the, this is there's this whole code of justice. You begin the book by talking about this guy who ran his motorcycle into this father and her his daughter killed the daughter severely injured the guy and on his 10th day in San Quentin he got stabbed to death by another prisoner yeah right I mean that's how you begin the book and it's like oh I mean we sort of knew this about what they do with pedophiles Mm -hmm. but and I never knew they did this with someone who just killed a kid but they do that even with people who just kill kids right and so that tells you that there's a there's a very powerful code of justice going on it's normative it's not written usually but it's acted out in very powerful ways right yeah and you know but not to, you know, there's a lot of different specific factors that went into that particular incident. So I wouldn't want to sort of say too much uh, about mm-hmm. that. But the broader point is about sort of tolerating. So why do they attack sex offenders? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, right. that's not something that's common in all prisons. Most prisoners don't like sex offenders or say they don't like them. But they, in California, they're essentially assaulted until they're driven from the general population. And they have to go into these um, uh, sensitive needs yards for sex offenders, former police officers, and gang dropouts. Hmm. Um, so, but why, why do they care so much? And so there are sensitive need yards. Yeah, and your... there's a, a fairly large sensitive SNY uh, population now. Um, it, they have their own gangs there now. Hmm. Uh, I haven't studied those ones specifically very much, but they're basically for people who cannot exist in the general population. Right. Um, 
And so my argument is that there, there's a sort of a, a, a rational explanation for why they assault uh, sex offenders and other people like that, which is that, remember that it's a community responsibility system. And so each group is responsible for all of their members. And so what you don't want is someone to be in your group who's going to cause problems for you that you are going to be responsible for. And so to the extent that you think that person's going to be in conflict with prisoners from other groups, then all of a sudden you're going to have to deal with those problems too. And so they typically don't want to take responsibility for those types of people um, and may sort of enjoy sort of, yeah, making sure that they're not affiliated with their group. It, it, yeah, it's funny. I, now I'm thinking about socialism. <laughs> I'm thinking about revolutionaries and I'm thinking about how every time someone tells me they want a revolution, I say to them, well, you're just going to be the next ruler. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. The shot caller becomes the next king. The shot caller of the gang becomes the, the warden in mm -hmm. a sense or a different warden, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting how they govern internally. Um, this first paper that I wrote uh, that looks at a written constitution, you know, I argue that it solves this Madison, Madisonian dilemma in the Federalist Papers. And he says, you know, how do we empower a state strong enough to protect our rights but constrain it from preying on our rights. Mm -hmm. And I argue that that's the same problem that prisoners face. How do we create a gang that's strong enough to protect us, but restrain it from preying on us? And we would say, wouldn't we? Competition. <laughs> so here's, I, this is what I wanted to ask you. For Mexicans, <laughs> this is such a, it's such a darkly funny question, uh, I guess. So I'm thinking about Mexican prisoners in California, and there are quite a few of those, right? Probably... 50 or 60,000, I would imagine, if there's like 120,000 uh, prisoners, American. something like that, right? It's going to be like about half, I would imagine. Yeah. Big chunk of the California. So that's a lot of people. Okay. Um, so they are different in that they have a choice of gangs, or at least they're more, there's more than one gang. No, they don't, they, have, a they don't have a choice. Oh, they don't have a choice. It's geographically oh, that's determined. Right. Nortenio and, right, 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 right. right, right. So t talk about that. The so, um, you know, I think people say that the borderline is somewhere around uh, Bakersfield. And yeah. if you're from south of there, you go That's with the right. southerners. And north of there, northerners, uh, unless you're affiliated in the Fresno, uh, air, broader Fresno area. So, okay. So if you're from L.A., you are assigned to which one? Uh, the so southerners. Oh, but which gang would that so, be? So, I mean, that would fall into a large umbrella organization, the top of which would be the Mexican, the Mexican mafia, mafia. Okay. Soreños, Southerners, uh, gotcha. sort of at the entry and, level. And Nuestra Familia started as a reaction to them or a defensive reaction? Yeah, to... um, they, they, they basically sort of were being uh, preyed on, they say, by members of the Mexican mafia, um, in part because they were sort of, uh, I guess, rural farm workers is, mm, is what mm -hmm. their their literature and tradition says. Mm. And so they weren't seen as being criminally savvy, like uh, like mm -hmm. city city folk. Um, so they, they banded together um, from rural areas um, in defense of the first gang. Yes. Okay. So, th so there's this forced separation, first by race or ethnicity, right? And then by geography. It's like they won't let people be free agents. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They won't let people be consumers in an open market. They will not let prisoners choose their own gang. Even when you're a Mexican and there's three Mexican gangs, you still don't are not given the choice. So again, the shot callers act a lot like nation states. They do not. They want to limit choice. They want to limit competition for themselves. Eliminate it. They basically want monopolies, and that's what they've gotten, mm -hmm. right? So even even for the Mex even for the three Mexican gangs, each one has a monopoly. I guess I'm imagining the Fresno Bulldogs probably have the Central Valley you know, covered, right? That's the monopoly there. You're probably forced to join them if you're from the Central Valley, I guess, you know, right? And so it's, it, that seems like an interesting insight. Yeah, so we don't, I don't, I don't have good data on the relative size of these gangs. And okay. so that's sort of what you're asking is sort of what's the economies of scales for gangs? And what, uh, no, I'm asking, it's more like a social psychology question. It's like what, what is the impulse inside the shot callers, inside the gang leaders to, to do this? Like, why did that happen? In other words, yeah. you know, there's the people at the heads of the society, both the, mm. the wardens, the state, the prison guards union, and the, and the gang leaders all have this in common. They don't want there to be consumers of any kind. They don't want any competition between them, among them, right? Mm. And that's the state, of course. It's a monopoly on violence. We know this well. And the gangs don't quite have that, but they want to limit, they want to create as much of a monopoly as possible. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't fully understand, but I think that there's strength in numbers. And so there's an incentive to say, 
you're going to affiliate with us. You're not going to affiliate with another group. Um, that seems to be a, a sort of key part of it. There's also, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, that there is an, an, a very fascinating episode that happened several years ago when the leading prison gang uh, uh, members, all incarcerated at Pelican Bay in the SHU. Um, what's, they, the sh what's the SHU? That's the uh, secure housing unit. Oh. It's sort of the uh, most, uh, most secure housing area. So it's usually single-celled, no interaction or contact with other prisoners or officers. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a, a row, a corridor, uh, where these leaders were all housed in the same area, different gangs, different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, but they coordinated, apparently, a system-wide um, 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 uh, protest against these harsh conditions, oh, yeah. which took the form of essentially tens of thousands of prisoners not eating. Hmm. Uh, and they, so they wouldn't eat for weeks and weeks in protest. Right. And it was, so it's this fascinating example where they actually did work together and where it wasn't cut down on racial ethnic lines. There's tremendous cohesion and, and collective effort to accomplish something that they saw as they're good. Now, I don't know all the details about that, hmm. but that certainly stands out in the sort of rival race-based, fully segregated did they, were they successful? Did they get what they wanted? I, it sounds like they were. Hmm. Um, the Department of Corrections now has what they call a step-down program, which allows people who are um, a believed to be gang members who are in the shoe to follow a process through which they can step down and rejoin the general population at some point. Hmm. Okay. See, this race thing, it's a problem, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's really, I think it's, I think also it's simply because we're in the United States and the United States has been obsessed with race for quite a while. I think that has something to do with it as well, the reason that they organize around race. Um, let's talk about, speaking of race in the United States and its long history, let's talk about Andersonville, mm -hmm. the notorious prison during the Civil War, which you've studied, you've written a chapter for your new book about, and I actually haven't talked to you about it. I just know that you've done it. I'm curious, what is it? What's your argument there? Yeah, so that's a, a fascinating case. It's a, another tragic case, mm -hmm. but analytically or intellectually a very interesting case uh, because a lot like San Pedro, Prisoners at Andersonville were overwhelmingly sort of left on their own. Officials provided some resources, but not very many. There were not guards uh, organizing this pen, this, this prison. Um, they just, at a very high rate, sent uh, up, uh, eventually uh, more than 30,000 prisoners to this camp. There was no infrastructure. There were no buildings. Many of them didn't have tents. There was a, a very broken and ineffective sewage system and they would give them scraps of food once a day. And that's in some sense what could have happened at San Pedro prison, mm -hmm. except for what? Except for they had access to economic resources, economic exchange with the outside community. They had the freedom to organize within. Um, they had the ability to uh, engage in trade, create wealth, have an incentive to do those things. None of that existed in Andersonville. There was, no, the, there was not a porous perimeter. They, they couldn't interact with anybody outside of the prison. In addition to being remote, uh, all of their family members were in rival territory in the north, so they weren't able to come by daily and provide mm -hmm. you know, food or anything like that. So it, it's sort of like a comparison with San Pedro, which is what happens if you are left alone, but you don't have access to civil society in exchange. Yeah. And it's pretty grim. You know, there is an incredibly high mortality rate, um, one of the highest death rates um, in prisoner of war camps in, uh, in the period. Um, there was at a time a sort of high rate of prisoner on prisoner violence as these groups of what they called raiders would steal from other prisoners, murder other prisoners. Um, so it was uh, incredibly uh, poor, incredibly dirty, incredibly dangerous, and a high level of death. And so um, it's sort of a case to look at where there's a failure of governance to emerge. Hmm. And I think it fails because they just simply didn't have any resources. Um, and there wasn't a lot to govern as a result. Mm -hmm. It was also a time of war. Mm -hmm. So they had to be on lockdown away from the rest of society in a sense. I mean, all of society was on lockdown. So the porousness of, you know, general porousness of society was diminished during that time. And, um, you know, it was political, obviously. So the Confederates had reason to punish <laughs> the, the Northerners, you know, the Yankees. So it was very different from Bolivia in those ways. That's absolutely right. right? There was also um, a, a regular rumor or belief that there would be a prisoner exchange soon. Hmm. And so if you think you're going to go home in a week, 
and if the uh, Confederate officials tell you that there's going to be exchange soon, you're not going to spend time messing with any of that stuff, right? right? You're not going to try to open up a little shop or create a little civil society group because I'm going home soon. Right. And so there were always, you can look at the diaries of former prisoners there, and they, they, they report on these constant rumors that soon this week, in a few days, we're going to be mm-hmm. released and we're going to be free. Um, so that short time horizon you know, really matters. Right. You know, they know that they're not going to ha- be here for 10 years. Right. Um, well, they also think maybe the war will end at any yeah, minute. Absolutely. Which it could have. Yeah. Right. So, so essentially, it's when the state puts you in the hole and then locks the door and leaves you there. That's no good. If the state puts you in a hole, but it then leaves you there to your own devices and the hole it can be climbed out of and you can walk around outside of it and come back in and go, that's much better. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> right? No, that's absolutely right. It's a funny thing. It's like this weird balance between weak state and strong state. Like what's the best? I'm just thinking of, you know, me as a prisoner. That's my only concern here, right? And I don't know what I, what's preferable here. I don't know if I want the Norwegian state where everybody I'm talking to works for the government or is somehow loyal to the government because a lot of the prisoners would be too, I'd imagine. Or do I want to just be left to my own devices with all the other people selling stuff in the Bolivian jungle? You know? Yeah. I, I don't know. So there's, you know, in, in political science, you know, we think about things like state capacity and um, sort of state failure. And you could think of two f- types of failed states. This is from uh, political scientist Michael Munger, someone I worked with at Duke yeah, University. Sure. Mm-hmm. And so he, he says that there's, you know, there's, you can imagine two types of state failure. One would be Somalia, mm-hmm. where there's no effective state there. The other would be North Korea, uh, which is a failed state in the sense that it's not accomplishing in any of the things that you know, people turn to the state to produce. One has incredibly little capacity, one has very high capacity, but they're both failures in some general sense. Uh, I mean, I don't think North Korea is a failed state in that way. I mean, it's a very secure place for the regime internally, right? It's very orderly internally. You know, I, it looks like a Norwegian prison, I would think, <laughs> well, <laughs> on, at least on the surface. Yeah, maybe don't get too caught up on the examples, <laughs> but it's that you can have a lot yeah. of capacity and yeah. that could be a good or a bad thing, right. or you could have very little capacity and that could be a very good sure. or bad thing. Yeah, it's a, just a tricky question, which makes it interesting. So there, you, the new book also has other chapters on sort of disparate topics, but what the, you, they're united by an argument, though, or a thesis. Yeah, well, the, the argument is trying to explain why prison social order varies across these very, very different settings. Mm-hmm. And the main argument is that it comes down to these issues of governance. And when officials govern really well and provide a lot of resources, you don't observe a lot of private or prisoner-based governance. Mm-hmm. They're making a sort of governance in the gaps argument and that if officials provide a lot of resources and effective administration, why would you spend your time trying to do that? And that seems to sort of explain, well, Latin American uh, countries and Nordic countries. And then the other argument is sort of further testing this claim about large versus small prison populations. In England, which is uh, the basis of one of the chapters, um, prisoners are not only housed in very small prisons, but they're sited very close to home. And what that means is that when you show up to prison, there's going to be a bunch of your mates from the town or even the the housing estate that you are there. So when you show up, your reputation's already known. You may already know the reputation of other people. And to go back to our earlier discussion, if your reputation, you know, takes a hit while you're incarcerated, when you leave, everyone back home is going to know about it. So the reputation is amplified, not only because it's a small prison, but because there's these social networks that existed before and maybe after your incarceration experience. Uh, which means that gossip and ostracism matter a lot. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to say a word that might cause you to leave. The word is Foucault. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> yeah, I figured. So, you know, I'm sure you know <laughs> his work started with studies of prisons essentially, mental asylums and then prisons proper. And The argument he makes there that I find to be particularly compelling is that, according to Foucault, there essentially have been two kinds of prisons historically, in the West at least. He only looks at Europe and America somewhat. One is what he calls the prisons from the regime of blood, which would be like the Bolivian prisons, which is just the state just very bluntly just punishes people and leaves them there and doesn't try to study them, manage them, exploit them, anything. They just punish them and put them away. And Foucault says, actually, there's a lot of what he calls the shade in societies like that, like monarchies, slave-owning societies, right, or prisons, Mm -hmm. because there's no one watching you. The authorities are not, God is not near you, right? 
Um, and then he says the regime, the modern regime, the new prisons are places where you're studied constantly. And most importantly, and this goes to your point about this ostracism, shaming and gossip. You are made, you are, if they're successful, you are convinced that what you did was bad and you have become convinced about how to be a good person. You want to be a good person, a good citizen, and that's reform. And so it's an internal process. You mm -hmm. internalize the, the, the shame, right? So, I, you know, it's, again, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Like, I'm not even sure which I prefer or what, you know, what's, what's preferable or what's the, you know, it's like, because they both have major costs to them, but they also have benefits. And I don't know if I'd rather be shamed and ostracized by 500 people on a daily basis mm -hmm. or left to my own devices at Pelican Bay. I really don't know. Like, <laughs> neither one sounds great, um, but, you know, right? It's not, it's not clear cut to me. Uh, yeah, it's not clear cut. I mean, I think that's why we need social science. I think that's why we need, you know, a massive survey of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people around the world. Yeah. Um, there's a group working at University of Cambridge that has done this in many different English prisons. And there's just a little bit now comparing Nordic and English. And I m mentioned this Dominican Republic study. Yeah. It would be fascinating to see, um, you know, several dozen more of those. Right. Uh, Foucault, just a, oh, yeah. you know, it, I'm, I'm a great fan, I, a student of. Um, I think um, his book it provides uh, an important way to understand the historical process. Mm. And uh, it's also rich with empirical hypotheses. Yes. Um, I work in a, you know, sort of a different scholarship tradition. Um, but no, I mean, without a doubt, um, uh, he has many important things to say about um, prisons and, and society. Yeah, it's this, it's this um, psychological process that I think is the biggest insight you know, mm -hmm. that he has. That that's, that's what separates the modern prison from the, from the ancient prison, which is that they try to work on the psyche of the prisoners, yeah. right? And that if they're successful, that your psyche will be transformed by the time you leave, mm -hmm. right? That's reform. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, I do not like the sound of that at all, of the government mm -hmm. changing my psyche in any way at all. So that's why the Bolivian prison still <laughs> sounds like the best deal to me, but I don't know. Here's something we haven't talked about. Uh, women, and that is a chapter in your, the new book. Also, you've mm -hmm. studied women, and you've talked about this in your old book as well. Um, very different, right? Mm -hmm. At least in the states, the women's prisons are very different. How they're organized by the prisoners, and just you want to talk about? Yeah. That? So, yeah. I mean, I look at um, famous studies of women's prisons in California. Sometimes the the very same prisons, um, basically from the 1960s to uh, the recent, uh, and. What you find when you look at the prison social order in women's prisons in California is that uh, they look the same now as they did 50 years ago. Interesting. And it's shocking to me. It's surprising because men's prisons have become radically different. Um, society is very different in many ways. Mm -hmm. Incarceration is different. But like the social order actually looks, it's not you know, identical, but it's sort of copy and paste. So yeah. why so much stability in women's prisons? And what is the prison social order? They, they don't have gangs. They don't have prison gangs. Mm. They're not very racially or ethnically segregated. Mm -hmm. um, they sometimes form loose-knit um, kinships. They call them families, prison family. And they'll take on sort of traditional nuclear family roles, mom or dad. They'll adopt kids. They're aunts, uncles, grandmas. Um, these are not permanent like gangs. They're not uh, lifetime re requirements. Mm -hmm. They break up, you disown a child, you divorce a spouse. Um, so they're fluid. And many women don't join uh, these prison families at all. So they're fundamentally different from prison gangs. And they've, always, they've sort of always existed since the earliest studies to the present ones. And so like, wh wh what's going on there? And my basic argument is, again, back to the size of the prison population. Women's prisons, I think the height of the prison population in California for women was something like 10 or 12,000 women mm. compared to more than 100,000. Mm -hmm. They're just much smaller communities. Those other mechanisms continue to work well. So we don't see any of this sort of centralized extra legal governance emerge in women's prisons. Hmm. 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 Okay. I'm sold. Decentralize. I mean, I'm for that generally in politics and economics. So I guess I'm for that with prisons. I'm just a little scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the uh, being stuck with your mates, you know, everybody from your neighborhood. I can imagine the pain, the psychological pain running a little deeper, actually, in those places. But maybe that, I mean, that is the point. I think that's Foucault's point, mm -hmm. is that once you get the shame in there, you don't need guards anymore. 
people will do what you want without any without any cops or guards. But the prisoners are enforcing different sets of norms uh, yeah. than what officials are. And so you can debate oh. whether these sort of, at some times they call it a code or a convict code. I mean, their rules for what's good behavior is sometimes different from what officials would want you to do. Yeah, so it sounds like the, ma the male prisoners primarily want safety and security. In regulation of activity that can affect other people negatively. Okay. So, you know, they say, you know, don't steal, pay back your debts, okay. don't snitch. Uh, don't complain about how bad you have it. These are actually pretty reasonable rules for anybody. And these are actual, essentially constitutional rules for the gangs, right? These are rules that are either written or they're handed down. These are actually form In, formulaic. Before gangs existed, there was not a written convict code, but people could express what it contained. Mm -hmm. Now the gangs do write written rules. Um, some of them are mundane, like don't throw trash on the tier unless it's being swept. <laughs> Uh, some of them are illicit. You know, a, a third of the drug sales go to the shot caller on the tier. Mm -hmm. um, you have to work out every day mm. for an hour. So, like, there's a variety of different rules. In Los Angeles County Jail, typically a, a prisoner will receive from the local shot caller a written rules of what's a, a appropriate conduct. Oh. Oh. Okay. So the rules are, go through them again? Uh, well, I mean, th there's many, many different ones, but it, it may be don't work, you know, you have to work out for an hour a day. Okay. Don't throw trash on the floor. Okay. Sorry. But there was, there was a set of rules in the book that you've mentioned elsewhere that seemed to be sort of universal or almost universal, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, but so a lot of these are instantiations of that earlier convict code, which is like, gotcha. don't make trouble for other people, right? Don't bring heat from authorities. Okay. And so throwing trash on the tier causes trouble for other people. So you know, don't do that. Gotcha. So some of them are more detailed, but there's a sort of strong overlap between the purpose of these earlier norms and today's written right. rules. Uh, talk about rape in prison, <laughs> right? What has this play into this? Um, I mean, it's a very complicated subject. Um, that's not something I've specifically focused on. A very provocative book um, from a few years ago by a criminologist is called The Myth of Prison Rape. I, I was going to say this, so sorry to break in, but like I actually remembered, not as a person on the show, Jim Goad um, was in prison. He talked about it. And on the show, he said he was, and I think he was in, he was in prison for multiple years. He never heard of rape of any kind. He said it was non existent when he was in the Oregon State Prison in Salem uh, for, I think, two or three years. And I was shocked by this mm -hmm. when he said that. Um, is that consistent with what you've well, found? Well, again, I mean, this is as a sort of uh, somewhat occasional reader of, a consumer of that research rather than a, sort of a top mm. expert on it. Is My understanding is that the best estimates of rape are about 3 to 4% of the population in the last either year or three years, mm. um, which is maybe less than many people think, but still like a very high number. Sure. Uh, qualitatively, uh, prisoners will often... Uh, I, I'm told to say that why would uh, why would rape be an issue? There's like as much sex as you want uh, voluntarily. Hmm. Uh, what was interesting about this particular book is that they said that people are always talking about prison rape as a way to teach lessons, sort of like um, a fable uh, of what not to do to get raped. Mm -hmm. So nobody, like, this book reports that People say that there's not a lot of rape going on, but there's a lot of talk of it. And it's the talking that teaches people how to avoid it from happening. Hmm. So not putting yourself in debt to somebody in some way that you can't repay, for example. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, so that's, that's probably the extent of my limited knowledge. Okay, uh, so the gangs don't have rules about rape um, that you're aware of? <laughs> no, not that I'm aware of. Okay, yeah. I, it's fascinating, and I love it because it's hard. And you're, you have... You have some answers that I generally agree with, but it's more that the questions you're dealing with are so hard mm -hmm. that I, that's what I love about it and respect. You know, it's, you found, you found one of those very few questions where I am still scratching my head after thinking about it for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> right. Do you find the same thing? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it, I, I don't, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I, there's a million ways. I have a long list of data that I'd love to have, but I'll, I'll never get, um, but yeah, I mean, we're just trying to get the best evidence available to try to understand these issues. Uh, I mean, it, and then there's broader questions that are raised that I'm still struggling with, like, should we have prisons at all? Mm -hmm. Should we put anybody in cages for anything? For how long? What should the punishments be? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. Like, how many people should be in California prisons now instead of 120,000? Should it be 10,000? Should it be 100,000? Should it be 50? I have no clue. I mean, I would imagine 
if I went to some of these prisons and spent some time there, well, I don't know. Would I want a lot of those people released onto the streets tomorrow or not? What do you think? Um, I, mean, I think that's, that's <laughs> tough to say. I, th I think um, it you know, depends why we, why we have prisons. Yeah, right. And, you know, it could be for punishment or revenge. Yeah. It could be incapacitation. They can't commit crimes while they're there right. uh, against people not in prison. It mm -hmm. could be that it's deterrence. People don't commit crimes because they don't want to go there. And it mm -hmm. could be rehabilitation. And um, I think they're very effective at incapacitation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're great at rehabilitation, uh, certainly the way that they're sort of organized in California. And it's, it's sort of not obvious to me why a prison would be a good place for rehabilitation. <laughs> Um, just, to, just in general, and describing, we're going to, you know, force a bunch of people who, who have had, in many cases, sort of like really difficult lives, and why would they like sort of have an entirely different outlook on the world, uh, that in a better way in prison? They're not doing a good enough job shaming them. Foucault <laughs> would say he would say at San Quentin. Seriously, they, he would say that they're not. They should have, if they were, from their own perspective, they should have more psychologists on mm. staff, more counselors, more priests, more more chaplains talking to the prisoners and getting inside their heads, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that may be true, I don't know. Yeah, um, in, in terms of deterrence, right. um, the research uh, I think is very compelling that the strongest deterrence are punishments that are swift, certain, and fair. Mm. So it's gotta come soon, it's gotta be a high probability that if you do this act, you'll be sanctioned, and you have to. It has to be proportional in a way that you sort of respect that there's something legitimate about that. Prisons are not swift, certain, and arguably fair. Mm -hmm. um, it's very unlikely that if you commit a crime, you'll go to prison. Um, many people are arrested um, dozens of times before they ever, you know, spend any time in prison. So it's very uncertain. Um, it's not swift, and the more severe the punishment, the less swift it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's also not swift in a second sense, which is that if someone gets a 15-year sentence, they're not going to feel the pain of the 15th year for 15 years. And if you think that in some cases people um, commit crimes out of impulse or an impatience, I want this now instead of working and getting something later, um, they discount the future a lot. So why would the 15th year have any influence on right. um, deterrence or not today? So swift, certain, fair punishments seem to deter the most, and prisons don't seem to do that very well. <laughs> I, I had a debate with Heather McDonald once, and she actually, during the debate, called for the institution of caning, mm. like in <laughs> Singapore. For, and that's swift, certain, and what's the other thing? Uh, fair. <laughs> fair. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think that's what she was getting at, actually, is that kind of old school, what Foucault would call regime of blood kind of you know, yeah. punishment. I mean, there is a, a provocative book by sociologist Peter Moskos. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Him? yeah. In defense of Caning or something the along those lines. Oh, is he? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's the ex-cop. And he, he poses the, to the reader the thought experiment, would you, something like, would you rather spend 10 years in prison or get 10 yeah. cane? And then most of us have the same answer, which is that I'll take the... The caning. I'll take the caning. Yeah. And so that's sort of, you know, so so... If caning's so bad, what does that say about, you know, American criminal justice? So. <laughs> exactly. My God. Well, look, thank you for this. And thank you for your work. And thank you for tackling one of the hardest questions there is, I think, in social science. And for doing such a good job at it. Great. Thank you. And um, I can't wait for your next book. And it's going to be coming out probably next year, mm -hmm. right? Yep, next year. So we hope to have you on again then. Cool. I'd love to. Cool. Thanks right. for doing this, man. Great chatting with you. All right. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To get your tickets for the Unregistered Live event in Brooklyn on July 16th with Nick Gillespie and Dave Smith, go to ThaddeusRussell.com.